Haystackers late ad from the editing bay tonight. I'm going to be in Minneapolis tomorrow. I'm going to be in Des Moines, Iowa. I like doing that thing with my voice. Uh, here's the deal. Minneapolis tonight, six 30 prize brewing stacky Benjamins.com slash Minneapolis. Uh, come join like-minded stackers. We're just going to hang out. No big presentation. I just love my time last year in Minneapolis. And I also love my time in Des Moines. However, in Des Moines, if you remember, wasn't able to get the word out until the last second. So I'm coming back to make it up to you Tuesday, the 18th. That is tomorrow night. As of right now, I'm going to be at Peace Tree Brewing. So stackybedjamins.com slash Des Moines to make sure you know where we are. But I think it's Peace Tree Brewing, stackybedjamins.com slash Des Moines. That also is at 630. Both nights, 630. Stackybedjamins.com slash Minneapolis, stackybedjamins.com slash Des Moines. Did I check all the boxes? I think we did. Oh, except this one. Press play, Joe, on today's episode. Here we go. My plan is sound, mathematically sound. It cannot fail. It's perfect. Three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Independent for life. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're going to learn how the credit sausage is made with experienced credit connoisseur, Christina Roman. Then for our TikTok Minute, one TikToker has discovered the key to scoring bodacious amounts of free stuff. We'll share his mind-bending strategy. And in our headlines today, one commentator has a new term for retirement, and it's not on-demand napping. What is it? Of course, we'll share. Later, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a stacker, and of course, I'll share some barley water trivia. And now two guys who have been trying to cure credit for years, Joe and our special co-host from the Earn and Invest podcast, Doc G. Wait, do I say Doc G -G 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 -G? or do I just go with the Doc G? I don't know. Just here they are. Hey there, stackers. Happy Monday to you. And in the co-host seat today is Doug. So, well... Almost stuck the landing. Came so close. Doc G's here. How are you, man? I am good, and I've been working on solving credit, as Doug was saying, and I think I've got it licked. That's disgusting. You figured out that you don't need credit anymore? You're just going to get rid of all of it? It's over. No credit problems for anyone. We are just going to forgive all credit. Doc G's like, I could score 100 on this. <laughs> Reset. <laughs> Zero. No one has any credit anymore. <laughs> Can totally score 100. We got a great show for you guys. Uh, first of all, for people that don't know Doc G, or if you're new to the show, Tell us a little bit about the Earn and Invest podcast, my friend. The Earn and Invest podcast is a podcast in which we have the 201 conversations, the next level conversations about personal finance and about life. How do we live our best lives today, regardless of where our money is at? And so join us wherever you listen to fine podcasts. Well, how about if we bring a little of that uh, 201 to this podcast today? Sound good? I think I'm always ready to have that deep conversation with you, Joe. Let's let's get the show moving. Doc G's here. Doug is here. Christina Roman waiting upstairs. Mom, let's get things moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Market Watch, written by Chris Farrell. I thought, Doc, this is a perfect headline uh, for you to comment on. A new way maybe to think about retirement. Retirement is so traditional. In quotes, it says, try periodic retirement to figure out what's next. Chris writes, during the recovery from the pandemic, several workplace catchphrases generated buzz, including quiet quitting, great resignation, hybrid work, expressions. These are expressions, by the way, that Doug has had forever. <laughs> Doug has been quiet quitting since 1974. Yeah. I've always been cutting edge. <laughs> and he's quietly resigned himself to a life of... How else do you think you escaped the carnival, Joe? That's exactly. Yeah. And hybrid work, which is what? Kind of working? Is that what hybrid work is? We work and then we don't work? Yeah. I don't know. Chris writes, expressions like these in aggregate reflect a much larger conversation. Rethinking work, purpose, 
and the good life and post-pandemic economy. Then Chris says he'd like to throw another term into the mix. He hopes we'll gather momentum with the aging of the workforce, periodic retirement. This is a thing, Doc, where you don't take one retirement that starts at 60 or 65. You take these mini retirements. And it seems like, I don't know, in some ways, why don't we talk about the positive first? Do you like this idea? I do like this idea for the right people. And the reason why is... You know, a lot of us don't want to put off living the life we want to live until retirement, especially if retirement may not be until our 60s and 70s. We want to kind of enjoy today. And so there are all sorts of mechanisms of lifestyle design where we say, well, how can we both make a living, but also do some of the things we want to do? And I think many retirements are a great way to do that, a way to say, okay, there is a season for work and there is a season or a time to take off. And if you can figure out a way to do that financially, it, you know, makes up for that fear of God knows what's coming in the future. You know, God forbid you die young and don't even get to enjoy yourself. And this is kind of a way of dealing with that anxiety. Well, what I like about it is, I mean, I, I really like what I do, but some things that you think that you're going to want to do more of are not as optimal as you thought that they were. When, when Cheryl and I sold our house and we thought we were going to be digital nomads, moved to Arizona for six months and then moved to Bali and then moved someplace else and then to Portugal and then wherever and just work from wherever. I figured out, Doc, that I hated that. And if I would not have had the ability to play test that through through this uh, series of unfortunate events, I would have never known. Like I would have had no idea. And I would have at 60 or 65 embarked on this tour where six to eight months later, I would have gone, okay, my whole, the whole thing I was dreaming about was a lie. And now I know that I could reset. It seems like we could all do that and have a more perfect quote later retirement if we get to play test it early. Yeah. I mean, this idea of road testing is really great in marketing. We say AB testing, right? The idea is you throw a little spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. And you can't do that if you're buckled down into a nine to five for the next 30 years. Like, you won't have a chance to road test any of it. So I agree with that 100%. Uh, I remember we had a topic like this a few years ago, and, and I got a great note from a woman who's a nurse. And she's like, okay, this idea of mini retirements, I can't do that because I will get fired. Like, I will get fired. But I do think I do think that she still could have done this to a little degree. Instead of taking a vacation for today, Doc, Maybe she takes a vacation based on the places where she, that she might want to go later, maybe doing some of the things that she might want to do later, like start preloading some of these activities that she's going to want to spend more time with. Yeah, and it is for sure true that certain jobs are more difficult to mini retire from, right? So as a physician, I have a license. And if you let your license go too long, if you say, I'm going to take a year or two off, you may have trouble getting relicensed. You may have trouble getting malpractice insurance. There are all sorts of problems there. But that doesn't mean that you can't do a six month sabbatical or a three month jaunt somewhere else or try something different or try to do a mini retirement where you build a little of your career into it. So a lot of people go overseas and do volunteer work as a nurse or a doctor where they are not employed at the moment, but they're doing volunteer work where they're still applying their trade. So there's lots of interesting ways you can do that. It's also a great thing to do if you want to change jobs, right? So you may say that for the season of my life where I wanted to be a nurse or a doctor, I did that. And maybe I want to be a barista for the second half or the second third of or the one of the thirds of your life. And then you just kind of <laughs> take time off and take some time off in between. And then you go back and do something different afterwards. That's a different profession. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of professions that, I mean, I'm thinking of nursing, where the time demands and the physical demands are so high that it's not like you can, on the weekends, go try out being a barista, because you just, you got nothing left in the tank, right? Instead of a mini retirement and going to actually do the thing you're thinking about, at least do the research. Let's say you want to write a book. Let's say you want to be an author, or let's say you want to, you know, I don't know what the other thing might be. You want to be a pilot. Those are things that require some practice and some licensing and certification. So at least do the research when you're instead of playing Candy Crush on your phone, at least start doing the research when you've got a break uh, to find out how, you know, what are the barriers to entry and, and what are the t time commitments and, and skills and things I need. 
Well, I think there's something else going on, you know, beyond Candy Crush, which is I think there's a lot of fear, Doug. I mean, I feel like I'm a nurse now. I know what nursing's all about. I understand this. I don't understand what being a professional DJ is or whatever the other oh, thing great is. Example. I don't know anything about that career. And I'm attached to the income stream I have today, right? I've yeah. if I've got a family that needs this money. I've got this thing. It's like jumping off a cliff. Like I have no idea what's in that fog out there. What do you say about that? It's the devil you know. Even if it's not the in, you're addicted to the income right. stream that you know nursing or any other current profession provides you. It's to your point at the beginning of that. It's the devil you know, and there's some comfort in that because you know how to handle those demons and you know how to mentally and physically cope with those challenges and. That's the scary part, whether you're of retirement period, regardless if you're going to another career, the re, you know, and I think Doc can probably speak quite a bit to this because he focuses so much on tr major life transitions. But that's probably what's holding most of us back from any kind of career change or retirement. I want to mention this whole fear of especially financially, right? I'm making money as a nurse, so I know that I can keep doing that and making money. But I think what we forget, especially if you are involved in kind of that financial independence or retire early movement is, you know, you are making a decision when you decide on mini retirements. But one of those parts of that decision is that you actually will do full retirement later. And so it's a trade off, right? So you may not be as secure financially because you're taking that time off, but you're also making the decision that you're going to work probably to a later age. And that's a very reasonable trade off. If you're at that point in your life where you're like, I need some time off from my job, it's very reasonable to push that ultimate retirement date down the line and say, I can work longer, especially if I could take some breaks in between and do some other things that really nourish my soul. I'm, I'm thinking as you're talking too that people I know that have made that switch have jumped off into that fog. The more you do it, the easier I feel like those people think it is like somebody that does it the first time. They're like, Oh, this seems really tough. And then they figure out, Oh, this wasn't nearly as tough as I thought it was. I, I feel like a lot of that is between our ears. And that once we actually do the thing that we want to do, we, we start building a muscle. Like it's almost a muscle of, Oh yeah, I'm used to switching. I'm used to transitioning. Well, I mean, it's analysis paralysis, right? So a lot of us dream of the life we want to live and are afraid to take the next step. Now, my experience, and this is just my experience, but I've known a lot of people who've done this transition and stepped off into the abyss. And it's very rare that you make that wrong decision and you pay for it the rest of your life. So it's very common to jump off the abyss, maybe to take a mini retirement, maybe to, you know, kind of jump into the void and find it's not what you thought it would be, or even have it cause you some stress. But it's not usually the death blow that people are afraid it will be you know, you have skills, you have abilities, yeah. it got you this far in life up to this point. So most likely you'll be able to pivot and find a way around it, even if it isn't exactly what you thought it would be. Unless you want to become a motorcycle daredevil. <laughs> <laughs> well, but besides that, Doug, besides that. I was looking up uh, data on this and about what kind of calms those fears, what makes you take that first jump and study after study showed that it's data. It is the more we research, the more we just feel comfortable so that we kind of learn the lingo. We understand what it, what goes into it. Like if you just start going to websites that are based on the thing you're moving to, it, it comes a lot of that fear. I think about even when I was a financial planner and we do this, we would start putting together plans based on if you made the switch, how much cash flow do you need that to provide? What's the minimum salary that you can accept? How long can you go without a salary and look for work? And then we start putting a plan in place for, you know, what does that emergency fund need to be and make it longer so that you can look for the perfect job longer. Like the more you had that data, the less of a jump it felt like. And then you were in, you start masterminding with people or, or interviewing people that are in that career like that. That makes it so much more comfortable. Yeah, I think that's a big point. Like data is the analysis part, but the paralysis part is that last piece you just talked about, which is yeah. building a community of people who've done this, who are considering do this, doing this and who have taken action because ultimately it's seeing other people who've succeeded and who become part of your community, which gives you the courage and the momentum to take action. And that's, I think that's a big point right there. And, and I think that's a big part of the fire community, by the way, is, is people almost daring themselves to do the next thing. 
you know, and then you surround yourself with people that have already made those moves and you go, oh, I could look at all these people. They've, they've done it. So I can, I can definitely do it too. Uh, we will dive more into that topic, of course, tomorrow in our 201 newsletter. We do that every Tuesday and Thursday, the day after these shows come out. We dive into all the topics. Of course, if you happen to have missed a show, don't worry. Kevin Bailey, who writes the majority of our 201, does a fantastic job of making sure that he fills you in on all the details and gives you curated links to deeper conversations on these same topics. StackingBenjamins.com slash 201 if you want to sign up for the 201. Hey, coming up next, time for our TikTok Minute. This is the part of the show where we look at either some brilliance happening on TikTok, brilliant advice from a TikTok producer, or it's maybe, air quotes, brilliant advice coming from a TikTok producer. We try to keep this 50-50 Doc G, which one we got today? Do we have brilliance or air quotes brilliance? I feel like OG is much more the air quotes brilliance. But since I Doc G am on today, it's going to be the real thing. No air quotes today. It is the maybe the real thing. I don't know. Hey, you know what I will tell you is, is that with all this talk about credit coming up with Christina Roman uh, right around the corner coming up next, uh, we thought that maybe... Maybe a TikToker talking about credit and how to maybe score some free stuff works. Let's listen in to this gentleman. And for those of you that are just listening, not watching this on YouTube where you can see the video, this is a gentleman in a pool and he has a handful of credit cards. What if I told you there was a way to buy things like this $100,000 watch without spending a single dollar of your money using business credit like this that you never actually had to pay back? Not to the average person, guys. This sounds crazy, but any business owner knows how this works. You know how personal credit works. Let's say, for example, you will get a car or a credit card in your personal name. You're personally held responsible for that. So if you were to go get a credit card in your personal name and you were to go max the card out, you're going to be held liable. And if you don't make that payment back, the bank could come and sue you. Now, what makes us different about business credit? Well, business credit, you are not personally held responsible for that line of credit. So let's say, for example, how I got this watch. I was able to open a business that I didn't really give a shit about i went and opened business credit cards in that account i then proceeded to go on buy this four hundred thousand dollars i'm going to turn around and sell it to a jeweler for eighty thousand dollars in cash which now gives me the cash i'll file bankruptcy on the company i'll never have to actually pay it back because i'm not personally liable for that american express card it's all liable underneath my business so how come how come that guy's not a credit expert (laughs) I was, about, I was about to say at the top of the show, I said that I solved the credit problem, but clearly it's been solved already. <laughs> yeah. There's no air quotes there, Joe. No air quotes. This there. is like Costanza saying, it's a write-off. It's a write-off, Jerry. This is from TikTok investors on Twitter, and uh, their tagline was, fraud anyone? Yeah. <laughs> All you got to do is declare bankruptcy on the business. Duh. Yeah. Yeah. But boy. Uh, please don't do that. No, not, not, not a good move. Can you take us through? I mean, it's probably obvious to a lot of people, but do either of you guys know a couple of specifics of why his logic doesn't work around where the liability actually falls and that sort of stuff? Number one, there's, there's very few credit cards out there that will give you credit without tying up your own personal credit. In fact, I was friends when I lived in Michigan with a, uh, with a guy who was, CFO of a um, dental company. Doug, you know that you knew this guy too. You met him a few times. His number one job, his number one job was to get the owner of the company's name off of their debt. And they, they were a multi, multi million dollar company. I would say they were probably a eight figure, maybe even nine figure company. Uh, so hundreds of millions, if not tens of millions of dollar company. And they still wanted the founder of the company's name attached to all of their debt. Wow. So you are not going to go get American Express. Isn't going to see that coming. Oh, <laughs> you'll just take out an American <laughs> Express card in the business name. Oh, yeah. Foiled again. So number one, mm. that, that may not work. Number two is uh, willfully buying a watch in a company's name. Like what it's, is, is that a company asset? I mean, there, mm. there could be some IRS problems there. Number three is it's just unethical. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, just, it's just bad juju there. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, what what comes around goes around. Yeah, yeah. it's just all, not- all jokes aside, too. Like, so I'm not an expert in this by any means, but there's this idea of piercing the corporate veil too. So, 
like when you start doing personal things within your business and unless you are airtight on your, let's say, LLC agreement and your articles and all of that, if everything is not 100 percent in order, you know, when they come after you, they're going to pierce the corporate veil and show that this is not really a business and this is going towards your personal assets and then they're going to come after you specifically. So to do what he's talking about doing and actually succeed, you'd have to be exceedingly organized and careful uh, and industrious to actually make it look like you weren't just building your own personal assets. The bad news is we played some of these uh, TikTok videos where it's clearly parody, right? So the woman we played last week, Doug, with the woman talking about uh, she's manifesting her future self. Right, right, right. Oh, that was know? hilarious. And her future self is going to pay for this. Yeah, her future <laughs> self is going to spend all this money she doesn't yet have. She's just uh, uh, making the future happen today. That's definitely parody. Th this did, didn't seem like nope. parody. This seemed like a dude just spreading bad advice. Who knew there might be bad advice on TikTok? Uh, coming up next, let's flip that around. Maybe it's a great segue on where you get your credit advice. One place, of course, if you're going to get credit, get it from the credit bureaus that actually give you credit. Experian is one of those companies. Christina Roman is just a fantastic individual. She's the consumer education advocacy manager at Experian. What I love about Christina is most people think that people that work for these credit agencies that come on the microphone, that those people are people that were born with great credit skills. Christina will be the first person to tell you she did not have great credit skills. She's going to tell her amazing story today. But before we get to that, uh, Doug, I think you've got some, some trivia for us. What happened on today's date in history? Darn right, I've got trivia for everybody, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And today was the day in history when 18-year-olds across the nation lost their rights. Yep, it was on this day in 1984 that the National Minimum Drinking Age Act passed, raising the legal drinking age to 21. Imagine the shock to alcohol sales as they rolled back by three full years. That put a major hurt on beer sales, but was a pleasant surprise for executives in the burgeoning fake ID industry. I mean, imagine if a big brand like Bud Light lost that many consumers in a short time. Oh, wait, they, they did? How was I supposed to know? I mean, I don't even really read the news. And second, a guy like me is more sophisticated than Bud Light. You know, since White Claw came a-knockin'. Seriously, the ladies love them. Pro tip, fellas, park a cooler full of claws next to you at a cookout, and they'll think you look like Jason Momoa holding a trident in an ocean breeze. The rest of the guys with their dad jokes and Natty Light and Milwaukee's best. Hey, speaking of best, the number one selling beer in America used to be Bud Light before they apparently decided to reset their customer base. My trivia question today is for those of you who have been living under a rock. What is the new number one beer in America? I'll be back right after I throw together a charcuterie board. Can't keep the ladies waiting. Hey there, stackers. I'm local legend and cooler Casanova, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we're talking about three painful moments in history. First, Bud Light losing its crown as the reigning beer in America. Second, the National Minimum Drinking Age Act raising the drinking age to 21. And third, Milwaukee deciding to call that beer their best work. I beg to differ. The National Minimum Drinking Age Act requires that states prohibit people under 21 from purchasing or publicly possessing alcohol as a condition of receiving state highway funds. Wow, talk about carrot and stick. And that, folks, is how 18-year-olds got sold out for pothole-free roads. Bad trade. My question was, now that Bud Light is out, what is the new number one beer in America? The answer is Modelo. Hey, fun fact, like Bud Light, Modelo is owned by AB InBev. And now, let's get ready to learn how credit works with Christina Roman. And I'm super happy she's here. Not only does she have a new report from Experian that is a little, this is a little concerning to me, and I'm sure it is to them, but uh, also going to tell us a little bit about her own personal credit situation. Christina Roman from Experian is here. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me here. I was so excited when I got the invite. 
Well, I absolutely love it, Christina, when people that, you know, hey, it's Experian, you guys are the pros, but you've been very open about the fact that you yourself had credit issues. You weren't a pro at this at the beginning. Tell us about Christina Roman and credit. Oh my goodness. Christina Roman in credit in her twenties was a hot mess. That's what I would describe myself. <laughs> that was, that was Joe Celci high too. It was the wild west of credit for me because growing up, my parents always told me like, avoid credit. Credit is the devil rather than giving me the tools to use credit properly. And so when inevitably I got a credit card, I didn't know how to properly manage it. And so what happened is I really wanted an Apple computer right out of college. I had gone to school for journalism and all throughout college, I had used a Mac computer. And so I wanted to buy one right out of college. I applied for a credit card to purchase that computer, but I had never had access to that much money. I got approved. I'd never had access to $1,500 at one time. And so rather than going and buying that computer, I went on a shopping spree. It's party and I time. Thought, yeah, I thought, well, I got approved for like 12 months, 0% interest. That means I don't have to pay it for 12 months. So of course, I'll have a job and I'll pay it off. I had no idea that that didn't mean I didn't have to pay it for 12 months. I just meant I wasn't going to have to pay interest for 12 months. So I missed payments. I got myself in a huge mess. I thought the best way to get out of this mess is to apply for another credit card <laughs> and of you know figure out. So it was a cycle, a, a vicious cycle of poor decisions until I started to get phone calls from collectors and I actually developed a relationship with a talking relationship with one of the collectors. Her name was Simone. And she was the one that actually was like, look, this is how your credit behavior is, is impacting your um, overall credit history. She really opened my eyes to all of the things that, that my behaviors were negatively doing to my credit. So that was a huge eye-opening moment for me. And then also when I went to apply for a car and I didn't get approved for anything under a 19% interest rate, that was another huge eye-opening moment for me. So um, I learned the hard way, but the great thing is credit can always you know, rebound with positive behaviors. And so I learned how to better manage my credit. And I'm excited now to be able to share that information with people. But you know what's funny, Christina, is that obviously so many, but well, heck, you're at Experian and this happened to you. We just spoke with uh, Miss Be Helpful, Yanali Espinal, who had this great analogy about, you know, she did well in school because she had a syllabus. Very yes. few, very few people get a syllabus. I didn't have one. You didn't have one when it came to our credit. And it's so important. We're going to use our credit all the time. In fact, you, I think, if my notes are correct, you went from credit disaster to just purchasing a house? Yes, I just purchased a house in uh, 2020. And I, having worked so hard to rebuild my credit, it actually enabled me to take advantage of a 2.5% interest rate, yeah, wow. which I feel so blessed because I had that information and I went on that journey to repair my credit. And then to be able to use it to then take advantage of an opportunity like a super low interest rate when the time was right, you know? So that's one of the benefits of having good credit and really focusing on your credit is that it can enable you to jump on opportunities when they become available. Now, right now, people are concerned about the interest rates for housing. So, you know, they're not super comfortable with purchasing a house right now, but just focusing on your credit, we're finding that a lot of people want that knowledge so that they can then be ready to jump on the next best opportunity when it comes their way. Well, and we're going to talk about kind of building that education system and certainly the tools that you guys have at Experian to help people with that. One of the things I love that you said, though, is that you got this person, Simone, in your corner. To have somebody in your corner with the heart of a teacher is a really cool first step. But really, let's talk about repairing your credit. What did you do? What did you learn that actually made you turn the corner to get from horrible credit like mine was to good credit? So one of the things I realized that I was doing was I was burying my head in the sand, right? I was so scared because I had all of this debt and I knew it was looming over me. I was getting phone calls. And one of the things that I did that really helped me was I took a hard look at where my, what my situation was with credit. I sat down with all of my bills and I said, okay, this is how much I owe to this credit card. This is the interest rate. And actually your credit bill does break down. Like if you can pay this amount of money, you can pay it off in X number of years. I also sought out resources online for how to reduce credit card debt. And one of the resources talked about a credit repayment calculator that calculated your interest rate. And if I pay this much, how uh, soon can I pay it off? And so I started to create a plan. 
Now, the good thing is there are a lot more tools available today than there were back when I was first starting this journey. And so when I say take a holistic look at your current credit picture, I think one of the best ways to do that is actually to get your credit report. And so you can get your credit report first from, yes, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax actually for free at annualcreditreport.com. And you can get it for free weekly through 2023, or you can use like a credit monitoring service, like Experian's free monthly monitoring service. And that will give you access to Experian's credit report as well as your FICO score. So you'll get to see uh, that information. You'll get to see when you get that FICO score, what factors are negatively impacting your credit score and what factors are helping your credit score. That, no, that's fantastic. Cause, and I love seeing it in black and white, you know, it's going to be ugly for a lot of us. It was ugly for me. And I think mm-hmm. until you stare that ugliness in the face and see exactly where it is, yes. you don't, it's impossible to fight it. What, it. what is the number one thing people can do to improve their credit score? What's the biggest determinant of improving a credit score? Making your payments on time. Your payment history is the number one factor in your credit score. So even if all you can make is that minimum payment until you can get in a cycle where you can start to really tackle that debt, make those minimum payments. Um, If you can pay more, even better, because then you'll pay it off even faster. So make those payments on time every single month. Know your payment dates, even if you have to, you know, set reminders, if you set auto pay to ensure that you're always making those payments. And then come up with a plan because the second factor impacting your credit score is your credit utilization. So if you're carrying a lot of debt right now, you want to come with a, up with a plan to help you reduce that debt. So that way you'll have your utilization also working in your favor. There's a lot of great methods for doing this. Some popular methods are the snowball method and the avalanche method. And so with the avalanche method, you're tackling your highest interest rate credit card first while still making your minimum payments on all of your other credit cards. And that just helps you over time to pay less when you're paying off your debt. And then they have the snowball method where you tackle your smallest balance first and you kind of build momentum and and excitement toward paying off that credit card debt. And then you tackle the next highest balance and so on and so forth until you're out of debt. Now it's really important while you're doing this that you also don't start to reuse those credit cards that you just paid off because then you're, again, putting yourself in that vicious cycle. So make sure that you're smart with credit. You're only making small charges and paying them off each month. I say your grocery bill, your gas bill, just right now while you're trying to get out of debt. Man, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, the credit is kind of the the leaves where your spending pattern is truly the root. And so learning how to take control of credit, that's for me. I had to create a cash lifestyle for a while where, Mm -hmm. where that helped me so much. And then I went back to credit on a much slower basis and then paid my bill off in full. Then I was able to take advantage of reward programs instead of them taking advantage of me and do, (laughs) do all these, all these different things. I wanted to ask you about which one you use. Did you use the avalanche method? Did you use the snowball? Cause I kind of used a combo of the two. I started off with the snowball to get excited. And then I switched over to highest interest rates. Once I got rolling. Exactly. I actually did the exact same thing, Joe, because it feels easier to tackle that smallest balance. You know, it's that momentum. You're like, okay, I did it. I got that one out of the way. Now let's go to the next one. And you you feel like you can put even more toward that because now you don't have that balance that you're paying every single month. So yeah, it was a combination of both. And honestly, it's do whatever keeps you motivated to continue on that debt payoff journey, right? Because if you're constantly paying and you're not seeing your balances reduce and you feel like like you're not doing anything, you're not impacting your debt at all, then it could feel overwhelming and it could feel like, why am I even doing this, you know, to begin with, you know? So um, it's really about finding what keeps you the most motivated. Man, you and I both had that feeling. I remember those days and not fondly where I was just, I, I I truly didn't know where to turn. It was just one step at a time, just one step at a time. And you can get there and Laugh about it now like Christina and I are right now. Let's let's yes. get to this study because you've got some information. This is a study of more than 2,000 millennials and Gen Z consumers. Let's talk about what you guys studied. You, you took a look at kind of their overall outlook, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we really we, we looked at millennial and Gen Z because they're going to be the biggest drivers of the economy moving forward. And so we wanted to get an idea of how current events and news is impacting their overall financial health. And what we found is that 
you know, 70% of consumers feel that the current environment is hurting their ability to be uh, financially independent. And really what we're, we're seeing this trend that they really are seeking out resources for managing their financial health. They want to know how to better manage, you know, their money and their credit because they realize that credit is going to be a big part of their future. It makes a lot of sense to me because when so many factors are out of your control, you want to focus on the one thing that you can control. And that is how you manage your money, right? So that was uh, one of the trends that we saw in the study. Well, and if we don't feel comfortable with things going on with our job, with the economy, with external factors, I mean, the first thing to do, grab a hold of your credit, build an emergency fund. Yes. Because, you know, if the seas are stormy, you should start putting up, I don't know the analogy, put up sandbags. I don't know. (laughs) Yes, exactly. My mom, she would tell me, um, always have enough to at least cover your insurance deductibles, right? So that was one way that I started to look at it. And then other people say have three to six months of your income in a savings account. Now, to me, when I hear that number, that could be overwhelming. I say, okay, just get started. Um, One of the stats that floats around frequently is that most people don't have enough money in their savings account to cover a $500 expense, right? Right, So that was always my goal. Get to that $500 threshold and then, you know, keep building on that. So I think um, it's really important to focus on that emergency savings. And if you're overwhelmed by the three to six months of savings, start small. Every little bit counts toward that emergency fund. Did you guys look at all at which part of this economic climate people are most worried about? Is it the job situation and uncertainty there? Is it interest rates going up like you mentioned earlier? Is there a certain piece that people are really worried about? For this study, it was news about layoffs. Yeah. And the and just the overall environment in general. Okay. Yeah. And if you think you're going to lose your job, there it is. I mean, right there, make sure you've got yes. resources to go back on. Yes. And also um, contacting your lenders is so important. If you feel like you can't make a payment, make sure that you contact your lenders and let them know about your situation. Uh, one piece of study shows that more than one in four don't feel optimistic about their current financial situation. I was in that spot. You were in that spot. Step one for those people? Step one for those people is to get active. Take a hard look at your financial situation. Make a budget that you can live within, a budget that allows you to save. That's really important is having that budget because it tells you how much is coming in, how much is going out. And it actually helps you identify where you can trim some of the fat on your spending. So do you have a ton of subscriptions that you can maybe start to get rid of right now, just until we get through this economic environment? You know, are there other ways that you could save? Can you uh, reduce your grocery bill? Can you reduce any of your other bills? So that's a great place to start is set that budget, understand where your money is going every single month and identify those ways that you can eliminate some spending to help you to save a little bit more. I like that advice so much, Christina, because I feel like so many people get wrapped up in the headlines. They get wrapped up on, you know, you and I have said the word economic environment, the phrase economic environment about 30 times already. (laughs) We get wrapped up in that. And yet your advice was purely almost to ignore that and focus on you. And I feel like when I focus on me and what I can do, I get much more optimistic than if I focus on the headline of the day, because the headlines are a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And we found actually 75% said they would feel more optimistic if they really understood how their personal finances worked. And that just starts with getting active. Because once you start to get active with your finances, you also become curious naturally, right? So you're going to start researching, okay, I want to build a budget. How do I build a budget? Okay, I want to pay down my debt. What are some best methods for paying down your debt? So you start to do that research and you become empowered, right? I want to also share that we have a ton of resources for anybody that's looking how to uh, manage their debt or manage their credit. Experian really believes in financial power for all. And so we have a lot of blog posts about just about every topic on credit. So as you're getting curious about your finances and you're wanting to be more financially empowered, I encourage you to seek out those kind of resources. And actually, it's funny, Joe, I was telling Amanda when she first presented this opportunity Stacking Benjamins was one of the first podcasts that I listened to when I was in my payoff journey. And I remember when I saw you at FinCon, I was so excited and almost like starstruck because I had listened to you on so many drives into Experian. I had 45 minute long drives. And so I wanted to learn about money and and Stacking Benjamins was one of the podcasts that really helped me do that. 
And you actually learned something listening to our show. What's up with that? And it was fun. That was what was best about it. It was fun. Well, let's talk about fun because I know you guys at Experian have lots of fun. And I know that you also have lots of cool resources. Where do we send people so they can learn more to start taking charge? Yeah, go to Experian.com. We have our free credit monitoring app there that you can use. And again, that gives you your FICO score, as well as the factors that are benefiting or hurting your score. I also want to shout out Experian Boost, which is a great way for consumers to add their positive rent, utility, streaming service payments to their credit report to give their score a bit of a boost. And then if they're just wanting to learn how to build credit, Experian Go is a great program that can help anybody that's not yet in the credit cycle build credit on their terms. So those are three wonderful products that we have available to help consumers. And then check out our Ask Experian blog. And then we're still on Credit Chat every single Wednesday on Twitter um, at 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern. So we cover a different financial topic every single week. And next week, we're going to talk about having a financial check-in. So you can also see us on Twitter there. I love that. And you know what? The people that go to those Experian Credit Chats are always... It's great to have that surround sound. You know, I mean, you talked about Simone at the front end, who is a fantastic teacher. And then having the just the right people in your corner and following the right people... I think on social media, man, when I started, yes. when I started cleaning up my social media profile and getting rid of some of the negative negativity and just focusing on the positive people that changed my, I don't know, it could change your whole day. <laughs> Absolutely. My- yeah. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people want me to do that on Twitter right now. <laughs> so yes. Yeah. And people that are longtime listeners of the show know that we've been a fan of Boost for a while because of the fact that I just never understood, Christina, why that's not part of the credit report anyway. And obviously it's not your fault or TransUnion or or Equifax's fault. It's the, um, you know, the vendors on those end have to be willing to report and that makes it difficult. So the fact that mm-hmm. you guys are able to pull that off can really, and rightfully so, make people's credit scores more reflect how responsible they truly are. Yeah. And that was something that we were hearing from people, you know, even when I started there in 2017, it was like, wait, but I pay my, my cell phone bill every single month. Why is that not a factor? Why do I have to take on credit card debt? And you don't have to take on credit card debt. You just, if you have a credit card and you use it wisely, that can go toward building your credit, but people often associate credit and debt and they don't have to be one in the same. But this tool really made it so that they don't even have to, to use any kind of credit card debt to help to boost their score. It's just using those payments that they make every single month to benefit them. We'll link to all the resources Christina talked about on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Christina, it's about time we got this done. Thank you for helping our stackers get better with their credit. I really, and for telling your story. Thank you yes, so much. Thank you. Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right. I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Christina for stopping by. And, and you know, Doc G, I love it when somebody who is great now with credit tells the story on how they got there. And you realize then that we can all get there. Because I remember when I, was, when I was actively destroying my credit back in the early 90s, and I was really good at it. I remember Joe's at war <laughs> with the credit industry. <laughs> you don't think I can screw this up? Oh, you just wait. Yeah, speaking of your trivia, Doug, hold my beer. Hold my Netty yeah. Light, please. <laughs> it's Modelo, Joe. Modelo, not Netty Light. That's right. Uh, is that how you pronounce that word? Modelo? I think so. It's not Modelo? I think it's Modelo. <laughs> 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 negra modelo. Not to, not to derail this whole conversation, <laughs> but anyway, back to credit. What what was really frustrating was I remember the statistics that I would constantly read, which was that people that have great credit have always had great credit. But Christina shows us, Doc, that you you can do this. I, I've actually I'm kind of worried now that I'm losing my credibility as a personal finance podcaster because I don't have a falling on my face credit story. Oh. And so I'm, I'm just not relatable. <laughs> he's, he's got to go mess up his credit. I got to go screw up my credit now. I, I, gotta, I, I, you know, there's this TikTok TikToker that told me that as long as I did it under my business name, there it is. What could go? I wrong? can't screw it up. Yes. Yeah. Well, no. If your goal is to screw it up. Could you see Doug Doc coming home with a bunch of stuff? And he's like, I'm looking for a Phoenix from the flame story. I need a Phoenix from the flame. We got to have that moment. 
Are you nuts? As I flash around my Rolex. Yeah. Doc G shows up in a Ferrari. What's going on? Oh, I put it on our credit card and I'm hoping that we default on it <laughs> so that I could come back. Talk about how dumb this was. Uh, big thanks to Christina. Hey guys, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline. Tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doc G, they put what you value first. Which is erasing all your credit card debt. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it says here, your loved ones in your time. But imagine if you're sitting around with your loved ones in your time, some white claws, the charcuterie board, and a credit score of nearly 800. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote at Haven Life. No waiting several weeks for a decision. They have really lovely customer support. Prices are affordable. It's all online. They've smoothed out the process. You can get on with your life. Stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Get your life insurance done now, people. You know if you're listening to me and you know you need it, let's get it done now. Hey, today uh, we are going to pivot to a note that we got, which stinks because we can't have somebody, we can't have a stacker beg us to give Doug a t-shirt today because we don't give any shirts if you don't call in. However, Jay wrote us and asked, with CDs paying 5%, can I move some of the bond portion of my IRA to CDs? I realize that 5% may not last for a while, but getting 5% on the, quote, stable portion of my retirement portfolio sounds nice, especially after the beating bonds took in 2022. Thanks. Doc, what do you think about moving some of his bonds over to CDs? You know, I think there's nothing wrong with it, but I I always like to say, you know, we're talking about short-term changes short-term bond rates versus long-term investments. And so, you know, I think it's fine. And I everyone gets caught up in what should I do in the short term? Because all of a sudden something has changed and it looks different than before. All of a sudden CDs are paying a lot more than they were before. And I think it's fine if you want to make those short-term changes. But long-term, what we're really looking for is a long-term investing strategy. And the idea is that hopefully you won't have to continuously move your money around. So, I think if you want to do that in the short term, fine. I think long term, a long term bond strategy or a long term CD ladder strategy, if that's kind of what you're interested in, is fine. I think trying to make decisions on all these short term changes ultimately gets exhausting. And I don't know if we actually end up better than when we started. Well, and that's there's a key, key phrase here, Doc, which is called reversion to the mean. And when you read that bonds took a beating, we will experience reversion of the mean, which means that that bond prices will not always do that as interest rates stabilize. We see bond prices come up and you'll end up then chasing returns, which is a bad thing to do because you end up then on the wrong side. Historically, if you do what did better last year, you usually came out much, much worse. In fact, Rick Edelman's book, The Truth About Money, his seminal book from the late 90s, early 2000s, that's been updated several times. Rick goes through this, that if you do what did best before or what did better before, which CDs definitely outperforming bonds, you will have a portfolio through throughout history that underperformed. Aren't we talking about 5% on a relatively small portion of your retirement portfolio? Because for most people, the stable portion of their retirement plan, I'll say their their investment plan for their retirement is a pretty small fraction of their overall portfolio. And so now we're really slicing down to some pretty small numbers. If we're trying to get an extra percent or two off of that, is that the case? Well, that's a great point. I mean, most CFPs are heading the way that OG is, which is forget bonds altogether. Learn to have the risk tolerance to ride the equity markets instead and to have cash. So much more of a barbell approach. Cash, which then would mean CDs, right? You you could keep some of that cash money in CDs, a little bit oversized portion there, a year or two in cash, and then everything else just keep in the stock market or real estate, the two long-term things that beat the heck out of inflation. So yeah, to your point, Doug, you're spending a lot of uh, brain power on not much uh, of your investment strategy. Hey, Steve, can you just make sure that you really emphasize when Joe says, that's a great point, Doug. Can you like, can you just hit that like three or four times? <laughs> well, that's a great point, Doug. That's a great point, Doug. That's a great point, Doug. 
all joking aside, I mean, we do see that as, as people are chasing the newest thing, right? Regardless of what that thing ends up being. And that thing isn't always something that's crazy or out of the box. Sometimes it is CDs, sometimes it is bonds. But as Joe was saying, I think when you're chasing, uh, you're generally looking at it wrong. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jay. By the way, Jay, if you would have called the Haven Lifeline instead, we would have sent you a T-shirt. <laughs> now Joe sounds like my mom. You can never even call or leave a little note. <laughs> Just give us a call. Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail to do that and get away from Doug's awkward uh, voice impressions. I've heard your mom. That does not sound like your mom at all. You don't think my mom's from Brooklyn? She's, <laughs> she's, she's not. She also sounds, and your impression sounds like your mom's a lovely lady. Your impression of your mom sounds like she'd kick your ass, man. Oh, well, yeah. She, she would just take you out back. Holy cow. Coming up on Wednesday, we've got a very special show on Wednesday. Uh, Kate Youngkin, who helps us lead our social uh, stuff along with mom's friend Gertrude. Kate is going to join us as our special guest co host because some of our stackers doing some cool things in the community. We try to do these a few times a year, uh, shine a spotlight on you. So the guest is you, and there are some people around you doing cool stuff, which is cool, by the way, Doc, that you know, we were talking earlier with our headlines surround yourself with people doing the thing that you want to do. We're going to talk about three stackers doing some pretty cool stuff uh, on Wednesday's show. Let's take a quick look at the community calendar before we say goodbye to this episode. On Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, I'll be on Instagram. The guest is still TBD. So join us and be surprised by who's going to join me on Instagram on Thursday. Also, you know, this interview with Christina Roman, we did live on the Fireside app. And if you want to hang out with us live when we interview future guests, sign up for the Fireside app. You know, the better thing to do is, the, is just get our welcome guide, stackingbenjamins.com slash welcome. That is links to our YouTube channel, to the different places you can listen to the podcast. If you're on Stitcher, by the way, listening to us, uh, Stitcher is going bye-bye. You want to use a different app to listen to us there anyway. And we have a bunch of those on our welcome guide, stackybedgements.com slash welcome. All right. That is just about it for today, which leads me to thank you, doc, for hanging out with us today, being our special, special guest co-host. I'm always happy to be here. And I have to tell you, if you were listening to that community calendar, I can't wait to hear your conversation on Instagram with TBD. I've heard so many good things about <laughs> TBD. I mean, it's like, I just, it just keeps coming up everywhere. I see it on schedules. I see it all the time. Are you down with TBD? <laughs> yeah, you know me. They're friends with that person, Anon, who has so many famous quotes. <laughs> I swear to God, TBD and Anon, it's your uh, your dream panel. I did almost forget to mention one more thing. I am in Minneapolis tonight with Stackers. Tomorrow night, I am in Des Moines, Iowa with Stackers. I have no idea where we're going to be. You can either email me, joe at stackingbenjamins.com, or I'm going to try to hit up the local groups, uh, the local financial groups. So if you're part of any of the local uh, financial communities, hopefully we'll have the word out there. You know what? Trying to book a place on a Monday and Tuesday night has proven to be more difficult than, than we thought. Plus, we're recording this a little early because I'm headed to Voyager National Park. And Doug, I'm, I'm going to go to the Twin Stadium. I've never been to Target Field. Oh, sweet. So, can't wait to see that, too. But I, I do think we should clarify, since we're recording this a bit early, it's entirely probable, almost a guarantee, that you will have found a place before yes. people in Minneapolis are listening to this episode. Yes, I have found a place. This will not be a maybe. Right. You send that out, and then they hear this, and they're like, we don't know where we're going to be. They're going to be like, oh, crap. Now yeah. he lost the spot, and now I'm not even going to go at all. Yeah. I think... A place called Prize, P-R-Y-E-S, I think, uh, is one of the few places open on a Monday night. And right now, I've gotten a response from them going, we'll get back with you. But I'm thinking, Doug, that on a Monday night, I'm like, hey, do you have, uh, you know, just a little area we can have? I don't want to reserve a room. I don't want to go through all that stuff, Doc, that you and I did in Cincinnati when we had that wonderful, wonderful meetup at the Economy Conference, uh, which was so fun. I don't want to go through all that rigmarole. I just need them to tell me that, yes, we have some room for you. So I think it's going to be a prize, but 
Yeah, but do you even really need to ask them to reserve a space? Not even reserve, but just say, hey, can we have a little corner? Because if you just show up and people start showing, like, you know, if some giant Italian family shows up with 15 people at a bar, they're just going to take over anyways. It's funny. We told uh, Elysian Brewing in Seattle, the one near the baseball diamond that we were coming. And they're like, well, we don't really have a spot reserved for you, but, 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 but come on. And we had 40 people that showed up and I felt so bad for the people trying to eat dinner in the area where we were because they gave us a few tables and nobody sat at the tables. We all mingled. And I remember at one point I'm laughing my head off and I look down and there's a couple who are clearly annoyed try, trying to, trying to have some dinner right next to where we're, where we're laughing it up. So uh, I kind of want to make that clear. You know what I mean? I just want to be a good neighbor. Like most people from Minneapolis. Good neighbors. <laughs> Want to be Midwest nice? <laughs> I do. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Minneapolis, I'll see you tonight. Uh, Des Moines, I will see you tomorrow. Joe, the thing in Minneapolis and Des Moines sounds amazing, but we got people living in L.A. and Australia <laughs> and Austria, same place, <laughs> that good probably point. are not interested in, in trying to venture to Minneapolis for a meetup. So how about we just do the wrap up? I think they should come join us in Minneapolis. However, yeah. if they're not, Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some of the lessons from Christina and make improving your credit a priority. Second, retirement? See if you can take some periodic retirement or at least do research so you can test drive your big plans. Future you will thank you. But the big lesson? Want a real financial tip? Buy the cheapest beer for all those heathens at the cookout and a few of the upper shelf brands like Schlitz for a discerning set of people. Put it in a koozie to camo it. It's about cutting costs, people. Thanks to Christina Roman from Experian for joining us today. You can find all the tools Christina talked about at Experian.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of the Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. It's going to sound weird, Doc, but I'm going to ask you, have you seen the bear? I have not. Why, why would I see the bear? Oh, it's so okay, I'm good. I'm talking about a TV show. It is so good. <laughs> I was like, no, Doug, don't show him the bear. You, well, there was a bear. There was a bear loose in Chicago at one point. Wow. So I haven't really? seen that bear. Uh, the bear is on Hulu.
and uh, oh, it's not your. It's not. It's the other bear. It's not the other bear. It's not it a is hairy a, bear. It's not, it's not I, the cocaine it's, bear. No, but I thought we were talking about like Doug's back. Have you seen the bear? <laughs> Nobody else was thinking that, Joe. Only Joe, because he has seen the bear. Because oh, Joe God, has actually just, seen the bear. No, can just, we get back to the point? Yeah, I guess we don't want to get into your private lives. The I just bear, threw up in my mouth. Yeah, <laughs> I, think I did, and it's my bear. The uh, the. the <laughs> The Bear is a show on Hulu. Started out last year, season last year. I think it came out in 2022. I want to say small-ish budget by comparison to a lot of other shows. Small budget, independent. The whole style and vibe and feel of it was kind of independent. It's about a guy who has who's a like one of the best chefs in the world, literally in the world, has to come back or chooses to come back to Chicago to take over his brother's restaurant because his brother commit suicide i might have seen one or two of those episodes that sounds strangely familiar you would have remembered it's in, especially season one is intense two yeah, words yeah, to yeah. describe it two words to describe it are frenetic and claustrophobic yeah. it just it you are v- very close in and they are moving very quickly the dialogue is so real they they're, it's so tight and they're all, they're talking on top of each other it feels Almost like a documentary because it doesn't feel scripted at in in very many places. You do have a couple of big names that have cameos there. One you don't even you don't even notice uh, the comedian who plays uh, Jeff Winger on Community. What's that guy's name? Um, <clears throat> uh, ah, it's right. Yeah, and then of course that. Oliver Platt has a small role. Oh, there's others. You know who sneaks in there in more like the second episode, maybe Molly Ringwald. Really. Yeah, I, I don't even remember Molly Ringwald. I know she mm-hmm. was he was in a group session for addicts. The lead guy was in, like sitting in a circle and she was the moderator and you barely see her and you, you see her face like, wait, she looks familiar. Who's that? Hmm. But there are those kind of cameos throughout. The and bear. it was so good. Joel so McHale. Well done. Joel McHale. Joel McHale. Oh, I yes. remember Joel McHale. Joel mm-hmm. McHale is the chef that he worked for. And he's a complete jerk. And I think it was the second time I watched the episode where I'm like, that is Joel McHale yeah. being just a complete. Anyway. And I didn't even spot that one until you told me about it. This was going back a year because you and I were watching it at the same time last year and we both loved it. It got so popular and so, so many critically positive reviews that in season two, stars came out of the woodwork to be cameos on this show. No, there's only two seasons. Yeah, just finished the the second season just, just got released. Second that's, season that's just always came my out. my problem because like when we're because now we only like watch things that have like six or seven seasons because we go through them so fast. Wow, I can't help you. So there. we like wait because then you get you get caught up on like two seasons in what a night or two of watching TV. I mean, come on. But a lot of these series, Doc, I get sick of after a couple seasons. Like w- when it goes from character based to plot based they generally lose me yeah yeah, like when all of a sudden they start having them do all kinds of crazy things you know they've been dating and flirting and finally they're like okay i guess so they got to get married you know (laughs) or the kid shows up or whatever you know that's why i say you should watch the americans watch the americans that's one of the few shows that i feel like stop you're wasting your time really (sighs) no because we love it no, no, okay, I, good, good, I good, am good. so I think all in it, on Americans. It's one of the few shows that made it all the way through and oh, was yeah. good from beginning to end. Totally I was, agree. I was telling you to shut up because I didn't want to hear it from Doug again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recommend that to people probably once a week. There are very Doug. few shows that I think can maintain the quality throughout. And very few shows have a good ending. Oh, that's one of the best endings I've seen ever yeah. on TV. The other one that I had a really particularly, I thought, decent ending was Six Feet Under, if you ever watched that. It's an older one. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I've been watching nothing but the, uh, you know, July every year. I don't watch anything but the Tour de France. That is, I just That say. has a pretty good ending. Oh, I wait, that reminds me. Have you guys been watching Breakpoint? Started Lost Interest. Oh, love Breakpoint. I mean, they tried to do to tennis what they did with F1. Oh, it's Except fabulous. They were more successful. I, I don't <laughs> I think so. I thought it was great. I loved Breakpoint. My wife is a huge tennis fan. I just like sports in general. And even she got bored. Just didn't oh, care I about thought, the, Oh, the I thought Breakpoint was fantastic. I'm with you, Doc. I didn't love that. I mean, I, I thought the, the F1 one was fine, but I like Breakpoint better. Oh, I don't. I like the F1 the best, but I do like the golf one as well. It's the same company that does all three yeah, of them. I yeah, I haven't seen the golf one. Yeah, the golf one's really good, too. Huh. 
Yeah. I like Love golf, but golf won better than tennis, but neither golf nor tennis was as good as F1. Well, you know what? Do you know what show has a great ending? <laughs>